All right, thank you. Welcome to our webinar on what is research data management. Uh, my name is Chantal Ritt. I am the interim research data management librarian at the library, and I'm joined by my colleague, Yarno. Uh, hi, yeah, I'm the senior scientific and computing specialist, and I work for IT research, so I can help you with all your computational needs. <laughs> thank you, Yarno. Uh, before we get started, I'll do a little bit of housekeeping. We do have the chat and the Q&A function open. Um, we do have some opportunities for engagement, so I'll encourage you to uh, participate in the chat. If you do have any questions, please put them in the Q&A. My colleague Yarno will be monitoring while we're presenting, uh, and we will have time at the end of the presentation to address your questions live as well. Uh, given that I am working in the country, my bandwidth isn't always reliable. I will be stopping my camera in order to share my presentation, and we will get started. Excellent. Uh, I would like to start off by acknowledging the land from which we are presenting from today. I acknowledge I am presenting from the traditional territory of the Mohawk, Algonquin, and Hidonosanage, and recognize the enduring presence of the First Nation people. My colleague Yarno today is presenting from Ottawa, the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin and Ishiwabe people. Today we'll be covering what is research data management. We'll discuss elements about the planning for a research management project. We'll talk about creating uh, an organization system for managing your data. We'll talk about uh, practices for securing your research data. And, I'll, and we will finish with uh, considerations when it comes to sharing your research data. At the end of this webinar, we hope that you become familiar with the research data lifecycle, understand the forthcoming policy requirements, engage with best practices to enhance your care in future research data management related um, practices, and identify resources and contacts for further support. To get us started, I want us all to think about why uh, data management is important. I'd like to invite you to add some thoughts to the chat. Maybe you have some thoughts generally on the benefits of data management, or perhaps you have some personal experiences you can share. We'll be sharing some of the reasons we have come up with, but please don't be shy. Let us know what you think in the chat. Well, here are some of the reasons that we know that data management is important. Many publishers and granting agencies are asking authors and grant holders to make the data underlying their research publications and intellectual products publicly accessible. Research data management also saves time and resources in the long run. And data management is a part of data sharing, which is increasingly visible because of concerns related to reproducibility and transparency. And data, especially in the digital age, is often fragile and easily lost. So what exactly do we mean by research data management? It involves the active organization and maintenance of data throughout the research process, and suitable archiving of the data at the project's completion. It's an ongoing activity throughout the data lifecycle. Here we have a visual representation of the data lifecycle, including the steps of planning, creating, processing, analyzing, disseminating your research, as well as preserving that data for future reuse. If one of your interests is sharing data to allow others to examine or build upon your work, it's important that it's managed in such a way that actually makes that possible. And even if you're not sharing your data publicly, you still personally don't wanna lose it or lose track of your analysis. Here's just a recent example that we've seen in the news. To understand the process of managing data throughout the life cycle, we should first define what we mean by research data. And here I've pulled the definition that's available in the draft tri-agency research data management policy. Research data are primary sources supporting research, scholarship, or artistic endeavors. They can be used as evidence to validate findings and results. They may take the form of experimental data, third-party data, monitoring data, or repurposed data. And all the digital and non-digital content have the potential to become research data. Research data, depending on the discipline, may be collected, created, or acquired in many different ways. And when we're thinking about research data here, what we're trying to manage, it's the, the raw data and not necessarily the aggregate data that you would have 
So plot is part of your publication. Researchers are responsible for understanding in advance the data retention and sharing expectations of their sponsors and funders and their institutions so that they can make a plan to budget their future storage needs and ongoing oversight of the research within their custody. So let's take a closer look at the tri-agencies as they are a major funding source for research projects here at the university. With the exception of data deposit requirements from the Canadian Institute of Health Research funded research in tri-council's open access policy on publications, the agencies do not currently have mandatory data share or data management requirements. Uh, NSERC does not have any requirements at this time, and SHRC does have uh, a data preservation and archiving policy uh, from some time. The tri agencies are in the process of reviewing and enhancing their data management requirements for agency supported research. As a step in this process, they released in 2016 a statement on principles of digital data management, and they outlined a lot of their overarching expectations with regards to digital research data management. But now we're seeing um, a push towards reviewing that process and enhancing requirements. The agencies in 2018 developed a draft research data management policy, which was anticipated to be released last year, but was postponed due to the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic. Certainly that has had a large impact on all of us. Once launched, and we anticipate in the near future, the requirements will be phased in. So even these new requirements uh, won't be required of researchers right at the onset. Under the draft policy, there are three main policy statements that apply to grant recipients and to the institutions. And we're gonna be taking a closer look at the requirements that impact researchers in particular. So under this new draft policy, grant recipients will be required to deposit in a recognized digital repository, their re digital research data, metadata, and code that directly support the research conclusions in a journal publication. And researchers will also be encouraged to complete data management plans as part of the grant process. So now that we have an understanding of a little bit about what research data management is, what we mean by research data, and some of the requirements that may be imposed on us, the first step in our lifecycle model is to plan and design the approach that you will take to manage your research data throughout and after your project. And the best tool in order to do that is a data management plan. At the most basic level, a data management plan helps researchers stay organized and coordinated throughout the research process. By laying out a clear plan of action, uh, DMPs make it possible to address potential challenges and snags before they come up, and ensure that a project workflows are organized in a way that'll work well for the entire team. The content and like length of a DMP certainly will depend on the nature of that research project and potentially the discipline. Generally, what you'll find in a DMP are elements that describe how data will be collected, documented, formatted, protected, and preserved, how existing data sets will be used, and what new data will be created over the course of the research project, whether and how data will be shared, and where data will be deposited and or archived. While the beginning of a research project is the ideal time to think about doing a DMP, it's never too late to assess your practices. So for instance, if you're collaborating with researchers from another institution or organization, not all research pro uh, partners may enjoy the same rights to academic freedom. So this could limit your ability and how you make your research data after the project available. A DMP can also shed light on questions on how and where you'll be uh, making that data available. And researchers may also underestimate the effort and resources to appropriately describe and document data uh, for deposit and sharing. So for instance, there could be a need to anonymize a data set to remove any personal identifiable information. The DMP will help you reflect and identify the human and financial resources for your data management and stewardship activities. So hosted by the Canadian Portage uh, Initiative, we do have this valuable DMP assistant tool and it has been designed to meet the anticipated data management plan requirements of the tri agencies. The DMP that you produce with this DMP assistant tool uh, has provided templates that are available in English and French, and it's ready to be added to any grant application. The tool guides researchers through key questions about data management. Uh, as we've seen just on the last slide, uh, it talks you through you know, what software will you be using? What tools will you be using at the, during the course of your research? Are you exploring and using metadata standards? 
Um, what storage and infrastructure requirements will you need during the active phase as well as post project? And what are some of the ethical considerations that you may face in working with your data? There is guidance and examples that are provided in this template. And as you can see in this image, um, next to each question, you will have guidance from Portage as well as uh, potentially some institutional guidance. And as it's a general template, not all questions will apply to all research projects. And certainly many disciplines might face some different requirements. So researchers are encouraged to answer the questions that are relevant to their work. And fear not, looking at DMPs published by others will help you in developing your own, or you can review your own existing practices. The Portage Network has published several exemplars, what they're calling them. So let's consider them model DMPs. And they cover a range of disciplines and research methods. Um, so they've released them with respect to digital humanities, mixed methods, natural science, the social sciences, and they highlight best practices in those disciplines. There are other sources of the exemplar DMPs, including the International Digital Curation Center. We also have an example of a DMP that was co-authored by um, our research data management librarian, Felicity Taylor, and the professor, Stephanie Hostein for the Meaningful Data Count project. This DMP will be the foundation of a forthcoming Portage exemplar. And as a PI is in, in this project, Practice Open Science and Scholarship, this DMP, for instance, puts emphasis on data sharing and reuse and offers insight into how to budget for data curation stewardship activities. It also talks about the local services uh, and infrastructure that they use at the university. So it's a good guidance if you're looking at creating one. You may be wondering, uh, what is the difference between a DMP and the ethics review process? So as we saw previously, DMPs help you reflect on the ethics and legal compliance with managing your data. But a DMP covers more than just the ethics review process, which centers on how privacy and confidentiality of the data you'll be collecting. A DMP could actually improve your ethics review protocol, and it helps you by doing that by broadening your consideration of potential, potential research ethics issues. Uh, so, for example, if you are working and doing re research with human participants, uh, writing a DMP can help you avoid using limiting language in your consent form. So if you are looking into sharing your data, you'd want to draft your consent form in such a way that that would be permissible. And you may have heard of the FAIR data principles. The FAIR data principles were first shared in the publication, the FAIR guiding principles for scientific data management and stewardship. And this was published in Scientific Data in 2016. These are a set of guiding principles that uh, put emphasis on making data, software, models, and other outputs findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. The ideal is that research data should be as open as possible, but restricted as necessary. These principles are getting traction in the scientific community. And their intent is to act as a guideline for those wishing to enhance the reusability of their data holdings. And it puts emphasis on enhancing the ability of machines to automatically find and use the data, in addition to supporting its reuse by uh, humans or individuals. So these guidelines include, for instance, providing rich metadata describing your data, having a persistent identifier like a digital object identifier or a DOI assigned to your data, and how to consider saving your data in preferable open formats. We'll look at some of these guidelines in more detail later on. And while I'll not be going into detail on the specific FAIR principles, I encourage you to consult the How FAIR Are Your Data checklist. So not doing proper data management, as we have seen, can be a serious risk for a project. Data management planning reduces these risks, and the FAIR principles can be seen as more of a framework to follow when designing a data management plan. However, the current movement towards open data and open science, including these fair principles, does not fully engage with indigenous people's rights and interests. These existing principles in the open data movement focus more on increasing data sharing, and these tend to ignore the power differentials and historical context of the First Nations people. So we have complementary uh, principles, the care principles of indigenous data governance, is people and purpose oriented and reflects the crucial role of data in advancing indigenous innovation and self-determination. So if you wish to work with First Nations, consider how you're interacting with their data. The First Nations principles of ownership, control, access, and possession, and these are more commonly known as OCAP, 
assert that First Nations have control over the data collection processes and that they own and control this information and how it can be used. First Nation Information Governance Center, so FNIGC, uh, offers a variety of education training opportunities that provide a foundation in OCAP. So on this next stage of the data lifecycle, you'll be concerned with collecting and creating your data. You also need to think about how this data will be named, organized, tracked, and documented. So here we'll be focusing on the important elements in data management about creating a system. Creating a data workflow or an organizational system at the start of a project or making sure you review the existing structure already in place in a project will save you valuable time in the long run. The best practices in creating a system to manage your data include developing a directory and a file organizational structure, establishing file naming conventions, utilizing version control strategies and tools, the practices of applying metadata, and to determine the long term file formats for your data. And we'll look at each of these in a little bit more detail. So one of the essential components of successfully managing your data is to establish a filing or directory structure for your records. You should structure these folders, whether paper or electronic, to correspond to, correspond to how data are generated and that complement the way your proposed or existing flows are in your team. Ideally, you should have arranged your data hierarchically, meaning you'd want to see folders within folders. Um, to keep it manageable, you'd want to restrict the level of folders to three or four deep. Otherwise, it could be um, a little lost. In order to keep this folder structure, for instance, um, we identified ways that we can divide our data into categories or attributes. And these attributes may be high-level projects based on time, data collection, or file type. And here we'd want to make sure to avoid overlapping categories. Here we have survey data analysis and knowledge dissemination activities uh, and we identify these as our primary folders and a key practice when analyzing your data here as you can see under the data folder is to keep a raw copy of your data so i would always suggest creating a folder for raw data uh, maybe make the file read only so that you don't want edits to accidentally happen or make a copy of the data uh, and make a copy of the data to analyze it uh, one of the advantages of doing this is that methods are always evolving or you may need to go back to the uh, unprocessed data in order to recreate some of your outputs. So you'll always be able to have a copy of that. And in creating your folder structure, think about how you go about looking for a file. That might help you in determining appropriate levels in your hierarchy. And most importantly, it's important to be consistent and document the system for others to follow. Uh, consider adding a readme file at the root of the folder we will talk more about how to create a readme file later. How you organize and name your files will have a big impact on your ability to find those later. I don't know about you, but I've tried searching sometimes for files uh, and I don't always come across what I was looking for until I started applying uh, file naming conventions. You should be consistent and descriptive in naming and organizing your files so that it's obvious where, what type of data you're looking for and what the file may contain. So here we have an example in our file naming convention. Uh, we started with the project name, followed by underscores, uh, looking at a standardized date format, along with a brief content description of the file and a versioning information. You'd want to avoid using spaces, dots, and special characters in your file naming convention. Uh, you'd want to be able to use hyphens or underscores, which is machine readable. And it's probably preferable to include any abbreviations in the file name so they don't become too long. If you are using any abbreviations, it's important to consider documenting those in a readme file, for instance, so that people have a clear understanding of what those mean. And it's recommended that you include versioning within a file as appropriate. This is especially important if you're working on a shared drive um, and not using collaborative tools. So let's take a little bit of a closer look at what I meant by that. Uh, versioning control is to capture a snapshot of a file or of a project's file at any moment in time. This allows you to easily review the history of the project, manage future changes, and revert to previous working versions if needed. 
Um, I've often done modifications to a tabular data set, um, and I needed to go back to see what was my thought process to make sure I documented that clearly. Uh, and versioning allowed me to see the progression of my, my modifications. There are a few strategies for versioning files and documents. At the most basic level, we have um, versioning is captured manually in a file name. And you'll see this, uh, it's particularly important if you have files on a shared drive or on your own desktop. An intermediate strategy is to use a platform with version uh, control built-in capabilities like OneDrive, Dropbox, and Google. And certainly we're seeing more and more research being done using Google and in, in our own OneDrive environment. Uh, Microsoft Office or Microsoft OneDrive and Google, for instance, uh, enable seamless collaboration. So you'll be able to collectively work on a file at once and these are track conversions. And of course, there are more advanced ways of using version control software like Git and here in Mercutial. Uh, they are more designed amongst programmers, but they, Git, for instance, can be used to track changes in other sets of files. The key takeaway here is that version control is not just for code and data. It should be applied to all your documents in your project. Taking a closer look at OneDrive, just as an example, as uh, most of us at the university are now transitioning to potentially using Google or even this OneDrive environment. Um, if you're planning to use, you know, make use of heavy collaborative features in these environments, you can enable versioning features and you can actually personalize or set uh, the versioning that you'd like to see. So you can determine if you want to be able to track only major versions or as well as minor draft versions. Um, and you can modify those settings. So when you do have versioning applied within OneDrive, for instance, you'll only be able to see as far back as 10 versions of a document. So keep that in mind as well. And now let's take a closer look at metadata. You've probably heard metadata being described as data about data. And while we may inherently know that good metadata is key for research data access and reuse, figuring out precisely what metadata to capture and how to capture that can be a little bit of a daunting task. Metadata essentially describes the relevant information about your research data set. It answers the, the who, the what, the when, the where, and the why questions. So for instance, it will help you and others think about uh, how to find this data, who created the data, who contributed to its creation, uh, when was it last created or modified, among other things. When we think about data, there are three main types, descriptive, structural, and administrative. Descriptive metadata adds information about who created the resource, um, what this data set is about, and what it includes. Structural metadata incorporates additional information about the data related to the other data sets or how it was organized. And administrative data provides information about when the data was created, modified, or who can access that data, as an example. So when you're looking to apply metadata, consider using an established standard or schema. So here we have, uh, just as some examples, these provide a list of core recommended metadata elements to capture during your project. So when choosing a schema or a standard to use, you'll want to consider what's right for the type of research you're doing and what metadata schemas are popular or the standard in your discipline. So for instance, we have the Data Documentation Initiative, which is a standard frequently used by social science researchers. And having a metadata standard is just one piece of ensuring consistent metadata entry. You'd also want to ensure that you're having a controlled vocabulary, which would facilitate browsing and searching. So ensure that, uh, Categories are being implemented the same way, or dates, for instance, are following a standard convention. Here, this is just a screenshot to show um, tools that could be available to you. Uh, we do have Collectica for Excel as an example in our library, uh, which you can access via remote computer labs. And it allows you to document your data directly in Microsoft Excel. So you can add a descriptive metadata um, following an open standard to like your variables, your code list, um, and that. So we talked previously about uh, documenting your workflow in a readme file, uh, adding a readme file at your file structure. So what exactly is a readme file? They are used to document changes to files and, and file names within a folder, explain file naming conventions for future reference. So again, if you're using acronyms in a file name, you'd want to make reference to what those acronyms mean. Uh, and they can accompany files and data being deposited in a repository. And I'll show an example of that at the end of the presentation. 
At the basic level, uh, in a readme file, you'll find project information, the title, the contributors or the authors, if there's grant information. Certainly, you'll have contact information, depending on the type of readme file you're creating. Uh, the location where the data lives, if you, are, if you have backups, how are those being uh, saved? Uh, useful information about how the data is structured and organized, if you need any special software to use the data of that nature. There are great examples that exist within the community. Cornell University has a ready template for you to complete, as well as the University of British Columbia has a quick guide on how to create a readme file for your data set. And so when you're also choosing a file format for your data, you need to consider the labor lifecycle activities. Um, at the data collection stage, you may want to choose a format that is uncompressed and flexible in order to have the most amount of use. And flexibility is found by choosing a standard format that is highly utilized either in your domain or at large. And to maximize accessibility and long-term value of your data, it's preferable to store your formats that have been freely available in specifications. So even if you're using proprietary software in the active phases of your project, um, you may want to consider finding a open format if you're going to save and make a, that data shared later on. In the best case, your file should be both non-proprietary and open and unencrypted and uncompressed. And these are just this table highlights some examples of common proprietary formats and preferred file formats if you're looking to make that data available in the long term. We also provided links underneath this table to advice from Libraries and Archives Canada, as well as the European Commission's Open Airs Data Formats for Preservation Guide. Now I'd like to pass the, the mic to my coworker, Yarno, to speak about uh, elements in securing your research data. Yeah, thank you, Chantal. Um, yeah, so when you talk about data security, there's two ways to interpret it. Uh, like you want to secure your data so that if there is anything uh, lost or broken, then you might want to get your data back, of course. So that's one way of uh, data security. Uh, the other security is um, um, being sure that your data is only accessible by you and not by anybody else. And that's uh, where the encryption comes in. And also the, the cloud storage where you can set up uh, all the permissions that you want for that particular project. Uh, next slide, please. So for backing up the data, uh, you can use what is called the three to one rule. So that means uh, free copies of your data, uh, two uh, at home and one offsite. So if there is something like a major catastrophe at uh, your place of work or at your home, wherever you store your data, that you have another copy of the data available elsewhere. So you will always be able to recover your data. Uh, for the offsite one, we at the university, as like Chantal mentioned, uh, we offer Microsoft OneDrive. So every researcher by default gets one terabyte of storage. Um, I'm not entirely sure how much uh, students get. Uh, it's either one terabyte or a quarter of a terabyte. And if you would like to work together with other uh, collaborators, then um, we can create groups that everybody has access to it. And we can also increase the storage if you need more. Uh, the other option is a network drive uh, provided by us. So we can provide your research group with uh, a storage that is locally hosted on the campus. And uh, that also means it's only available from the campus. So it's not accessible from the outside world. Uh, but we give uh, five terabytes for free for your research group. And if you want more, uh, you can buy more for a thousand dollars per five terabytes. So it's fairly cheap uh, storage, uh, but the disadvantage of it is that it's only available uh, on the campus, or it could be an advantage if your grant says that uh, data has to be stored locally. Uh, for instance, some grants specify that data has to be stored uh, within Canada. Uh, although in that case, you can still use Microsoft OneDrive because their data centers are actually in Canada. Uh, that has been guaranteed by Microsoft to us. And any files that you store on those cloud solutions or on our network drive, they are automatically backed up. So if you accidentally delete a file, you'll be able to recover it uh, pretty easily. Um, there's also self-service. Um, if you want to have your own solutions for backing up, like you can use an external drive uh, and then use, if you're on macOS, you can use the time machine to back up to that. 
or for instance, uh, Duplicati is like a free uh, backup tool that you can use. Um, I wouldn't really recommend using external drives because they can get lost or you can, um, uh, it keeps the data in one place. Whereas for a cloud solution, there will always be a backup available for any data you store there. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so for the University of Ottawa, we have Microsoft as 365 available. Uh, that's a new name, what used to be called Office 365, even though Microsoft is still quite confused about that. <laughs> um, but uh, OneDrive that uh, I mentioned is part of this. So uh, there's more to uh, Microsoft 365, and that's the collaboration suite that you have. So any file that is stored on OneDrive, you can open uh, that file in Word and Excel, um, and others can open it at the same time and you can make changes at the same time. And any change you make, make uh, the other person will see in real time. So it's a great tool also for collaborating. And it doesn't have to be uh, you out of our researches. It also works for external researchers. So you can add uh, external collaborators to your group and everybody will be able to edit the files that you store in there. Uh, it also comes with Teams, so you can chat. I have, um, you have an entire chat that you can use and you can make video calls. And it also comes with uh, free copies of Office. So at the University of Ottawa, if you uh, go to uh, the Microsoft site and you log in with your uh, UX credentials, uh, you can download uh, five copies of Office for your devices or five um, copies for your mobile devices like tablets and phones. And to have uh, enhanced security for uh, your OneDrive, uh, I would also highly recommend em enabling MFA. So MFA stands for multi-factor authentication and it makes your account access secure because it doesn't just ask for your username and password. Uh, but once you try to log in, uh, you get a notification on an app on your phone asking you to confirm if it's really you that logged in. So that's why it's called multiple, multiple factor because it's your username and your password and a device that you physically have. Uh, next slide, please. So for securing your data itself, um, if you store your data on OneDrive, it's already encrypted. So that's a very nice feature. Um, but if you store data locally and the data is conf uh, confidential, uh, you should make sure that the data is stored on an encrypted and password protected device. So if you use uh, a, an iPad or uh, a mobile phone, if you set a password for the device, uh, usually the device is also automatically encrypted for you. Uh, so if you collect data in a field that is sensitive, uh, you definitely want to send a password on that device. Um, and for storing the data locally on your own computer, um, I would highly recommend uh, using uh, encryption, uh, especially if your computer is uh, a laptop that uh, could get lost. Like Chantal mentioned at the beginning where uh, a laptop was uh, lost and the data was not encrypted, so then you're in big trouble. Um, when you want to share files, um, you can share that uh, again through OneDrive. So you either invite somebody or you send them a link with a password. Uh, but if you can, if you want to use uh, email, that's also possible. But the file that you are sending, uh, it should also be encrypted uh, because email is not very secure. Uh, and people might be able to intercept your emails and uh, get the files that way. Uh, but if you do uh, encrypt your uh, file that you sent uh, with a password, uh, you need to make sure that you don't always also send the email, sorry, also send the password uh, over the same email, because if someone intercepts your email, they'll also have the password. So you would either call them or you use like a chat program or something like that. Okay, next slide, please. So for the encryption, uh, there are various types for that. Uh, on the picture on the right, uh, you see sort of what the encryption looks like. So in the file explorer, I have a, a file called a test file, and it just contains the text hello world. Uh, but then when you apply encryption to it, uh, the file name is totally uh, garbled. And then when you try to open that uh, file in your text editor, uh, you just see a whole bunch of uh, nonsense and yeah, good luck trying to get the information out of that. Um, 
So there's two types of encryptions. Uh, there's the, the full disk encryption, and that encrypts the entire hard drive of your computer. So if your laptop is then stolen or it's lost and somebody tries to access the data, uh, they cannot uh, without the password. Um, all the operating systems uh, come with an option to enable this. Um, well, almost all the operating systems, I should say. So for Linux, uh, you can use Lux. Uh, Mac OS always comes with a file fault. Um, and Windows comes with a bit locker. Um, but Windows only provides BitLocker for uh, Windows Enterprise or Windows Professional. If you use Windows Home, uh, they will not uh, give you BitLocker. So you might want to uh, consider upgrading to uh, uh, Windows Professional or Windows Enterprise. And if you have a laptop uh, from the University of Ottawa, you already have uh, Windows Enterprise and uh, BitLocker will already be enabled for you automatically. Um, then there's also the other type of encryption, which is called uh, file level. So instead of encrypting your entire hard drive, uh, you also you only encrypt uh, certain sections. So you can encrypt an individual file, or you can encrypt uh, an entire directory, and then that data is safe. And the reason why you want to do that is if you are working on your computer and you get a virus on your computer, even if your hard drive is completely encrypted, uh, if you're logged in and you can read the data, then so can uh, the virus. And that might just be desirable. <laughs> so the way around that is uh, file level encryption because file level enables you to uh, have encryption only for the data that you're currently working in. So if your computer is compromised and you're not currently working on that data, then it's still safe. Uh, and that is in comparison to um, to full disk encryption, where if you have access, the virus has access. Uh, okay, next question. Oh, sorry, next slide. <laughs> so the other big uh, storage facility that's around uh, is uh, provided by uh, Compute Canada. Uh, you may have already heard of it. Uh, so if you are a Canadian researcher, uh, at any educational institution in Canada, you have access to Compute Canada. And they have uh, four really large uh, compute clusters uh, that also provide uh, a lot of storage. So you can get uh, by default, no, not by default, uh, you can get uh, 10 terabytes of storage uh, upon request. And that data can be stored on any of those four clusters that are listed in the slide here. So we have uh, Cedar, Graham, Beluga, and Niagara. And as you can see from the specifications there, they are really, really big, powerful computers. So Cedar is getting close to like 100,000 uh, CPUs and they have more than a thousand GPUs. So they're very powerful. And the nice thing about this is that if you store your data on a Compute Canada, you can also work on your data on Compute Canada. So if you store your data there, you can run your programs on there. You don't have to transfer data back and forth, uh, but you can directly work on it. And you can create an account at uh, the link that I have below. And it's all free. It's uh, paid for by uh, CFI and provincial funds. So you as a Canadian researcher will be able to uh, access this. Uh, if you're a student or a postdoc, then uh, your supervisor needs to make an account first and then they can sponsor you. But uh, you'll have access to the same uh, group storage. And that's all. Yeah, okay. And that's it for me. And back to you, Shanta. Thank you, Yerna. Uh, that was a great overview of a lot of the technology and infrastructure available during the active phase of your research. And certainly we'll be uh, looking at other infrastructure solutions when it comes to data sharing or disseminating your research data. Uh, two key practices I just want to point out, but we're not going to discuss in detail in this next section, is that you want to ensure that you own the data uh, so that you have the rights to redistribute it and that the data has been anonymized before you share any data publicly. So there are various options that you could consider when you're looking to share your research data. Some of these options include uh, supplying your data as a supplementary material to a publication. Um, you may choose to disseminate your research via website, 
or now, um, as many may become more familiar, choose a data repository. And there are several options within that sphere as well. You can look at an institutional repository, a disciplinary specific repository, or maybe even a generous repository location. There are certain elements you may want to consider in making this choice. Uh, when you choose to disseminate, for instance, your data as part of supplementary materials, you may be signing over your copyright under a data transfer agreement. So uh, that data may actually be available behind a paywall, for instance, and not necessarily available. Um, data that's also only kept on a website could be very vulnerable to long-term access. If we're not using uh, platforms and such like Git, um, we're just using a website, PIs change, data could be lost, the integrity of that. So it is recommended that you publish your data in a supported data repository. There are a lot of advantages to using a data repository. They provide infrastructure for long-term data storage. Uh, they can be indexed into other uh, search platforms, and they really facilitate the searching and retrieval of data. Data repositories also enable and enhance research tasks. And so that could be managing your data requests and sharing files. So you can maybe disseminate your data under an open access model or even restrict access and have a, a request for access or a requirement implemented. And they facilitate data discovery and reuse. And they often provide value added services. Um, and that could be assigning a, a unique identifier like a DUI, providing a citation uh, for the data sets long-term and help with support with long-term preservation of the data. How do you go about choosing to identify a repository? Um, one of the first recommendations would be to look at the requirements or recommendations set out in a funder's guideline. So for instance, CIHR under their open access policy uh, maintains a list of examples of research outputs uh, and the corresponding publicly accessible repository or database that they would recommend for that discipline. Another option, if you know what uh, journal you're interested in publishing in, many more are now providing recommended repositories uh, within those uh, disciplinary subjects. And if those don't necessarily meet your needs, there are other uh, directories such as Fair Sharing and R3 Data that provide a list of certified data repositories. And often these will meet the FAIR principles. So you'll be assigned a DOI, um, they provide uh, discoverable with metadata and whatnot. And if a disciplinary repository is not available or suitable to your needs, you can also consider using a general purpose repository. And here are just some of the examples that you may be familiar with. Um, Figshare, Zenodo, Open Science Framework are certainly popular ones. In the Canadian context, we have the Federated Research Data Repository um, that has been configured for large data sets, as well as Scholars Portal's uh, Dataverse. And one of the advantages of using Scholars Portal Dataverse, for instance, is that it has actual uh, servers housed here in Canada. And this is a, one of the software repositories that we support, or a data repository, pardon me, that we support. And it is a publicly accessible, secure, multidisciplinary, and multilingual repository for research data. And we do have an institutional instance that is available for students, faculty, and staff, or affiliated researchers with UOttawa to deposit their research data. Some repositories already have uh, required standards that you must adhere to when applying descriptive metadata to your data set that you're going to deposit. Um, but many repositories only require the basic information, such as a title, a contact author, and a choice of a license. Um, we recommend to increase the findability and usability of your data that you endeavor to include um, a more descriptive title, abstract, and keyword of your data set. So think of that description as you would an article abstract. You really wanna provide sufficient information to a, an end user to let them know if that data set is gonna be relevant to their needs. Especially if the data set isn't open access and it is uh, on a restricted access basis, you wanna let them know um, before trying to inquire with the, the author or the data creator for permission to access if that would meet their needs. You'd wanna ensure that a DOI is assigned and this provides a more straightforward way to track research outputs. And uh, if you are thinking of sharing your data more broadly, we would consider using a Creative Commons license such as CC BY or CC0 for your data. And if you're not familiar with what license to use, we do have a copyright librarian at the library who supports that um, support. And you'd wanna give uh, credit to citing your data within your research publication. So the best practice as well is to be able to identify in your research publication where your data is available. And that's often by providing a data acknowledgement or a uh, in your citation reference list where your data set is housed with the DOI. 
And here's just an example of what has been deposited in a Scholars Portal Dataverse. Um, you'd want to include the anonymized data sets as well as any of the supporting documentation to support its reuse and its in, uh, reusability. So that could be a codebook or a readme file that outlines the methodologies and whatnot. Um, and as we talked about earlier, what elements you'd like to see in a readme file. Here we have various tab data sets as well as a readme file made available in a document format and that describe the methodology used to create a lot of the, the file structures. Uh, the Portage Network has made available a resource known as Documentation and Supporting Materials Required, and they provide links to uh, templates available to help you support and describe your data set to support deposit. Looking at the next section, we are going to come to conclude on the support and services available at UOttawa. We highlighted a lot of great resources, and we want to make sure you know where to go and find them. So here we have a URL to the research data management webpage uh, hosted at the library, and you'll find guidance on what is a data management plan, as well as linked to the DMP tools and the DMP exemplars. We go into concepts that you should consider about, again, where you should publish your data. And we also have uh, resources that were recently created to support data sharing in light of uh, the rapid responses for COVID uh, funding. We also have links to training and events that are being put on uh, with a focus here on research data management. Similarly, we do have the website here for scientific computing, which will outline the infrastructure and services available and also provide links to seminars being put on by scientific computing. Today, we went over a lot of the brief elements of what are, constitutes uh, good data management practices. And here we have uh, available for you a brief guide for research data management. I should have mentioned it at the onset, but we will be sharing the presentation slides with you so that you don't have to worry about capturing all the URLs. And here, like we talked about today, uh, some of the best practices highlighted in this takeaway are uh, the importance of saving a raw data version in its original format and working from process versions, or work from copied versions, pardon me, uh, the importance of backing up your data, uh, applying metadata to describe your data, considerations that you'd want to have in processing your data, as well as archive and preserve your data uh, by sharing your data in a suitable data repository. Coming up, I would like to highlight as part of the series, we do have other webinars available. Next up would be Yarno, again, on IT services, specific resources for professors. Coming into March, we'll be taking a deep dive, uh, looking at spreadsheets to the map, so best practices when mapping your data and visualizing your data uh, using ArcGIS. And into May, we'll be going into a, a more deeper dive into using Scholars Portal Dataverse for data sharing. We also provided links to other workshops provided by the library. Uh, I do believe there's also one coming up in February on open access to knowledge, which will be looking at some of the considerations around data ownership as well as other additional seminars available from uh, scientific computing. So now we'd like to open the floor for questions and address any that we may not have had the opportunity to during the presentation. I believe if you raise your hand, you can either ask the question in the Q&A at the chat, or if you raise your hand, we can unmute you in order for you to be able to ask your question. I do see a question from Lena, is Inverter an index of institutional repositories? Inverter is a discovery service, but there is also a service for depositing data in Inverter. I'm happy to follow up with you and provide you additional context on that if you're interested. And I see that you did respond that to Yarno. And yes, uh, Hayat, we will be sharing a copy of the presentation. We will also be uh, making the recording of this available as well. Are there any further questions or comments? If not, I'd like to thank you for participating today. Uh, I'll make sure to get you a copy of the presentation before the end of the week. And we'll also be making a link to the presentations that were recorded available from our respective registration sites. Oh, there's a question. Oh, there is a question from Lena. <laughs> Uh, what happens to our Google Drive after we leave UO? Um, yeah, so that 
drive will no longer be accessible. So you will need to uh, either download the data or migrate, migrate it to uh, the storage you get at the new institution. Certainly this was just an overview in an hour we can't cover and go into too far in depth to all the research and management uh, considerations. Uh, while the chair will be giving in French, we do have a copy of the presentation. Um, due to unforeseen circumstances, we postponed the French presentation, but we could follow up with you with the French copy as well of the presentation um, and make that available. And how long the data is intended to keep? Some companies keep their data for 50 years. That's a great question. Uh, the, you would look at the data retention requirements, either of your funder or of your institution. Currently right now, UOttawa um, does have a data retention requirement for research data, and they specify looking at the funding granting agency sources. Um, and this is where they're not all consistent. So if you're doing, for instance, regulatory health data, some of those uh, data retention requirements are 25 years. And others, I believe with SHRC right now, it's several years. Um, but it will depend on the institution or the funding requirements of your research. I see some questions in the chat about um, OneDrive. <laughs> so does, offer, does OneDrive offer the same storage? Um, so the same storage as uh, Google Drive. Um, so Google Drive was, I mean, the Google Drive file stream, it was unlimited. Uh, but for OneDrive, we start with one terabytes. And if you want more, you can just ask for more. So it's essentially unlimited as well. <laughs> and the other question is, uh, can I keep OneDrive data beyond graduation day? Uh, no, that's the same thing as um, with Google Drive. So you need to get off the data first. And yeah, <laughs> after your account uh, is closed, uh, the storage goes away as well. So by applying good data management practices, um, if you do have to migrate your data, you'll know what data is valuable to keep and migrate somewhere else. Are there open research data repositories available at the university? Uh, so I, we do have, again, Open Scholars Portal, which is available and supported. We will provide curation services support um, in depositing data in Scholars Portal. And of course, there are other, um, we also have an institutional repository, UO Research, which is primarily for your preprints, as well as um, the accepted version that you're allowed to deposit of your publication. And there are other open repositories, such as FIG and Zonoto, um, but they're not necessarily subscribed to by the university. I'd recommend looking at the website for research data management on where should I publish my data. We do provide a list of recommended repositories and which ones we have a support for. We still do have some time if there are any other questions. Uh, Yarno, I will mention there is a question in there. Is it fairly yeah. straightforward to migrate data files from Google Drive to OneDrive? Um, it is. It just takes a while, depending on how much data you have. <laughs> uh, I mean, the easiest way is to install both the Google Drive client as well as the OneDrive client and just uh, transfer the data like that. Uh, it also takes a while because you have to download the data and it uploads it, but it is the easiest way to do it. And if you have a lot of data, you can contact me and uh, we'll figure it out. <laughs> Thank you. If there are no other questions, uh, in our presentation slides, uh, we do have, oh, sorry, is there a one-stop place for all my RDM needs? Actually, uh, Lena, what I will do was a link on the slide here, but I will go back and provide it in the chat. Uh, we do have, a web presence where we do walk you through many of the basic requirements of research data management as well as the local services and support. So that is available through the library and it will talk through um, like workflows. It'll talk about considerations about establishing organizational structures, file naming conventions. Certainly it is very general in nature and if you have specific requirements you can reach out to me and schedule a consultation and we can talk about establishing a workflow. Perfect. 
Any other questions? Again, thank you so much everyone for taking time out of your busy schedules. We will send a copy of the presentation. And uh, if you prefer, I can send the English and French ones to everyone as well. Chantal, I actually have a question here. Did you send the, did you send the link to all panelists or all panelists and attendees? Oh, that's a good question. I did put the link in and I see by default it's all panelists. So let me add all panelists and attendees. Thank you, Andrew, for catching that. No problem, so the I link I provided, start. thank you. I just saw the question the I, show up. Yes, thank you. The link is to the RDM website and I will go in and actually add in Uh, my colleague Jarno's website as well for scientific computing, where you'll have more information about the services and infrastructure available through that site. And these links will also be in the slides that we'll send out. Right? That's right. These links are in the slide as well. Well, have a great day, everyone. And I hope you join us for our next uh, session in the RDM webinar series looking at IT services. Okay, thank you. Have a good day, everyone.